What's going on Evangel Nation? We just finished a dynamic service. We talked from the subject title, Ready, Set, Go. The subtitle was, Every runner needs a hand. It came from the story of Elijah. The Bible says, then the hand of the Lord was upon Elijah. Elijah was able to outrun a chariot because of an invisible hand, an intangible hand that brought tangible results. And the same intangible hand rests upon you. And I believe that God wants to bring some tangible results based upon what he's placed on the inside of you. You got to look at the whole message in its entirety. It's going to bless you you. As always, thank you for your continued commitment, your support, for liking, for sharing, for helping us to get the word out there. Thank you also for joining our community. We call it Evangel Nation. It helps everyone all across the world to join with us in an effort to fulfill the Great Commission. And as always, until we meet again, stay connected. Peace. First Kings chapter 18 verse 46. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 11. Let's read. It reads, Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, giving him supernatural strength. He girded up his loins and outran Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel, nearly 20 miles. Then I'm going to read Ecclesiastes 9. Verse 11, and let's marry these scriptures. It reads, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Neither is bread to the wise, nor riches to the men of intelligence and understanding, nor favor to men of skill. But time and chance happen to them Let me ask you a question. Have you ever asked yourself the question why one athlete succeeds and another athlete fails? Why one person succeeds and another person fails? Why one runner wins and one runner fails? You know, there's a story that happened in the 70s about a racehorse who was owned by Penny Shinnery. The name of the horse was Secretariat. You have to understand this about Secretariat, that when no one picked her or him, his owner took a chance and selected him based upon a coin toss. And even though it appeared she got the short end of the stick, she could see something in Secretariat that no one else could see. She saw ability. And years later, after being considered the greatest racehorse of all times, after the death of Secretariat, they cut the horse open and realized that his heart was larger than the average horse. That typically the heart would weigh eight pounds in a horse, but Secretariat's heart weighed 22 pounds. So it was larger. He broke records because he had something that everybody else could not see. He had heart. And can I prophesy to somebody on this morning? The reason you're going to win the race is because you have something that other people don't have. You have something that other people can't see. This is why you've been able to endure what other people died in is because you have a big heart. And so even though people were looking on the outside, it took an owner to realize that there's something that I can't see, something that's intangible. And it wasn't discovered until after he died what was intangible because you can't see the heart of a horse from the outside. It takes knowing the inside. Perhaps this is why God speaks of David and says man looks on the outside, 
But God looks on the inside. And so we see here that Secretariat, as well as Elijah, have what we call attributes that are intangible. These are attributes that are incapable of being perceived by sense or being realized or defined. Intangibles are the things that cannot be detected by the five senses, by your eyes, by your ears, by your touch, by your smell. Cannot be detected by that. It takes a different type of radar. I want you to understand this, that even with athletes, that the intangibles don't always show up in the scoreboard. That it's really hard to define what the intangibles are, but you know it when you see it. Many times, they are the unexpected, overlooked attributes that many people bypass because they don't recognize its significance. I'm looking back at Ecclesiastes, and Solomon is the writer of Ecclesiastes, and that's wisdom literature. He says something that should mess with us. He said, the race is not given to the swift. Translation, everyone that wins a race was not fast. The race is not given to the swift. Swiftness is what's obvious. In order to win a race, many of us would agree that you have to be fast. But Solomon is scratching his head and saying that the race is not given to the swift. Nor the battle to the strong. It seems like it would be obvious that if I'm going to win a battle, I need to be strong. But Solomon, the wisest man under Jesus, said the race is not given because you have speed and the battle is not given because you have strength. And if I was training for a race, I would be working on my speed. But Solomon is saying this is a conundrum that even the people that work solely on speed were losing races. And the people that were working solely on strength to be a world power, they were losing wars. I believe what Solomon is saying is that there was something under the sun that was beyond the natural eye. That it took more than just speed to win a race. Because some of us have been mimicking what's obvious and we have not been able to duplicate it in our lives because perhaps it's the intangibles that are making the difference. Perhaps it's the intangible. These are the things that most people overlook. I, I love what the scriptures say. The scriptures say that some put their trust in horses. And some put their trust in chariots. But the believer will put his trust in the name of the Lord. I don't know about you, but horses and chariots are tangible. The reason it's harder to put your trust in the name of the Lord, because it's intangible. See, that's why the enemy will bless you with horses and chariots so that you cease to put your trust in the name. Horses and chariots I can see. A name I can't see is intangible. And what God is saying, that if you're going to win this race, you got to rely on what's intangible. Now, I know who I'm preaching to because I'm a practical man, too. I like to see how I'm going to win the race. I want to see how God's going to come through before he does it. I want victory and deliverance that I can see. But what God is saying, the church has to shift. Just because God has blessed you with something tangible does not mean you should put your trust in something tangible. Because I just happen to believe if you have enough things that are intangible, it can produce what's tangible. I got to prophesy to some of you, you see tangible blessings because of an intangible blessing. 
The blessing is not just around you. The blessing is on you. Look at somebody say, the blessing is on me. It's on me. Because watch this. Many times we would trade something intangible for something tangible. Come here, Esau. We'll trade our birthright, something intangible, for something tangible, a bone of beans. And the truth of the matter is we miss out because we're after what's tangible, but we don't realize that what's intangible can produce what's tangible. And the reason we're losing the race and we're burnt out because we did everything tangible. But what Solomon realized is that the people who win the race has something intangible. And I don't know about you. I'm not running to lose. Paul encourages us to run to win. And I don't know about you, but intangible things. Are valuable. This is why we took time to celebrate. It's his breath in our lungs. Because breath is intangible. You thank God for your car. But you never thank God for breath. Because the car is tangible. And breath is intangible. And we tend to take things that are intangible for granted. But it's the things that are intangible. That make everything else tangible. And this is why, as preachers, we spend a lot of time preaching about horses and chariots. Because that's what's appealing to our flesh. But we never tell you the secret that it comes because you put your trust in the name of the Lord. <laughs> Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added. Are you still with me? And I came here to tell you that before you see the tangible thing, you have to acknowledge and be aware of the intangible thing. Can I prophesy to somebody? God didn't choose you because you had a lot of tangibles. This is what he says. He uses the foolish things to confound the wise. He chose you because you had something intangible that other people couldn't see. They still didn't get it, Elder Mike. Let me try it this way. There's a team on the West Coast that just drafted a young man that everybody is critical of. That's because on the outside, you can't see why they chose him. But understand this, it was not your responsibility because even though you're a fan, you're not the owner. And so the owner saw something, perhaps, in this man that we can't see on the outside of the man. This is why he chooses David and does not choose his brothers because God knows where he placed. Y'all don't believe me. He says, I put earthen treasure or treasure inside of earthen vessels because I will put something intangible inside of something tangible. And this is why you better not judge me prematurely because you can't see what God put on me or put in me. But in a matter of time, what's intangible will become tangible. There's some things you can't teach. There's some things that are not taught. They are just caught. It's called intangibles. Some of us have had bad relationships because we just looked at what was tangible. We looked at our hips. But we didn't look at a walk. And a walk is what's going to keep your marriage together. Not a hips. Let me straighten up. Not a hips alone. It's the intangible things. Because it's the intangible that produces the tangible and I feel like we come to a place where we no longer have value in the intangible. Love is intangible, but it should be expressed in a tangible way. This is why the Bible says Christ demonstrates his love. His love was intangible, but the demonstration made it tangible. I can't see your love. Until you express it. I can't see loyalty. Until you express it. I 
I don't even know what's in your heart until you express it. Because after the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Those are intangible things. And what the text is saying, people that win the race, win it because they have something intangible. Why don't you look down your road and say, it's more to me than what you can see here. You better say it like you mean it. It's more to me than what you can see. I know I'm fearfully and wonderfully made on the outside, but there's more to me than what you can see. If it was Sunday night service, I would preach it like this. I don't look like what I've been through because there's more to me than what you can see. I know I'm suited, but there is also a fighter on the inside of me. So let's go back to the text. Happens after the showdown of Mount Carmel. After the fire came, then the cloud appeared and the rain began to come, the Bible says. And Elijah has to run through it. When you have the intangibles, there's some things you got to run through. The text says very clearly that the intangible thing that Elijah had on him, the Bible says, then the hand of the Lord was upon Elijah. If I had to give this message a title, I would say every rudder needs a hand. The Bible says, then the hand of the Lord. Now, the hand of the Lord was upon Elijah, Elijah was about to enter a race that he was no match for. Because how can a man win a race with a chariot? And I want to remind you that this is not just any chariot. This is the king's chariot, which means the king had the fastest horses. And yet, Elijah had God's hand upon him. So he's able to win a race that is no match for him in his own might. But when God's hand is upon Elijah, he's able to do what seems impossible. I love Elijah because even though God's hand initiates it, but Elijah also has to use his hands as well. He has to run through it. That's the reins, but he also has to run with it. The Bible says that he girds up his loins. He has on a long rope, and he has to gird it up and tuck it so that he could make it to his destination. He couldn't cut it. He had to tuck it. And there's some things you can't cut in life that you've got to tuck. Now, I also want you to understand this. That this was warfare terminology because in New Testament, we understand that we're also so supposed to gird up our loins. In other words, some of you didn't realize that when you signed up for the race, you were also signing up for a war. You were also signing up for a battle. You were also signing up for opposition. And this is why you've been tempted to give up in the race because of everything you've been facing. But that's a warrior on the inside of you because when I take up my loins, then it puts me in a position and preparation so that I can fight whatever's coming my way. And I came here before to tell you that before God releases you, he's got to set you up. And some of y'all haven't been taught well, so let me help you out since I'm your pastor. It's my fault. I want to help you that in this season, you got to be prepared for battle. This is why the Bible encourages us to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. Because when you're running in the right direction, the enemy is always going to try to stop you. He's always going to try to impede you. He's always going to try to block you. But enemy, when I take up my gird... When I tuck my shirt in, this means war. I know some of y'all don't take off your shirt, but you take off your earrings. God says you got to do whatever it takes to get prepared for the next move. Because nobody said it would be easy, but I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. What does it mean to tuck? It means to move something around so that I can still function. 
I say to move, to reposition something so that you can still function and finish the race. There are times where God won't remove the thorn, but you got to learn how to run with the thorn. Because it's what you're able to carry that's going to cause you to win the race. Even though he had God's hand on his life, he had to use his hand to tuck it. Because watch this. You'll trip over what you don't tuck. How many people know we don't finish the race? Because we start tripping. When the race gets tough and rough, we start tripping. When we see the battle, we start tripping. And God said, why don't you tuck it? Tuck it looks like casting your burdens on to Jesus, for he cares for you. Why don't you just tuck it? Tucking says, listen, this will not be a stumbling block, but this will be a stepping stone. You got to tuck it so you won't trip it. Trip over it. There's some things you got to compartmentalize so you can still function. Because the enemy is not winning until you stop functioning. Or until you become dysfunctional. But when you tuck it, you say, I can still carry it and I'm still making progress. You know you're getting stronger when you can carry things and still make progress. That's proof God's hand is upon you that you, should, you can carry stuff that other people would be tripping over because God's hand is upon you. Look at somebody say, God's hand makes the difference in my life. If you knew how much I was carrying this morning, you'd be praying for me right now. But thanks be to God who always causes me to triumph. Some of you looking at the way I walk, but you don't know what I'm carrying. You don't know the weight on my shoulders. You don't know the weight on my mind. But because God's hand is on my life, what was meant to break me is making me. If that's your testimony, I want you just to take the next 20 seconds just to give God some glory. I thank God for the hand. So he tucks it and he carries it because he doesn't want to trip. And because God's hand is on his life, he also doesn't get stuck. Let, let me preach to somebody because somebody is mad that the king didn't give you a ride. He didn't even offer to give Elijah a ride. But Elijah didn't need a chariot because God's hand was upon him. Can I preach to you? You don't need what you think you need. When God's hand is on your life. And because it started to rain, that means the pathway could get muddy. But when God's hand is on your life, you don't get stuck in what other people get stuck in. Because God is faithful, so I'm not tripping and I'm not getting stuck. Look at somebody say, I'm not tripping and I'm not getting stuck. I was stuck all year in 2023, but I will not be stuck all year in 2024. It's forward progress for me. I'm forgetting those things that are behind me. And I'm pressing towards the mark of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. Forward march. That's my testimony all year long. Because God is faithful to do what he promised. Look at somebody say, run with it. Run with it, run with it, run with it. Tuck it and run with it. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It's because of his mercies that we are not consumed. Because his compassions fell in night. You got to learn how to tuck stuff and keep it moving. See, this is the problem. Your enemy is upset with you because they don't know you're still carrying it because of the way you tucked it. Because when you tuck something, it's not out for everybody to see. When you tuck it, you're carrying it in private. When you tuck it, you're carrying it in obscurity. That's why they think you got a light burden, because you learn how to tuck it. Even though your marriage is on the rocks, you're still making him biscuits, because you know how to... You can't cut it, tuck it. I'd be tripping too if I untuck my shirt, but thanks be to God who gives the strategy to tuck it. 
I lost my dad 12 years ago. And I could have taken 12 years in hiatus after all of that. But I had to tuck it so I could still function. It doesn't mean it wasn't there, but I had to put it in a position where I could still function. Some of y'all are like, he don't even care about his dad. The devil is a liar. I just learned how to tuck it. And just because I tucked it, see, some of y'all, y'all want to cry and stay stuck in the mud and stay stuck in that situation. But you got to learn how to tuck it. I press towards the mark. That means it's not always easy, but with God's hand on my life, it's possible. Some of y'all praising God right now. and You went through hell this week because you learned how to tuck it. Elijah tucks so he can make forward progress. You got to learn how to run with it. Yeah. What you're carrying is going to ensure that you win the race. <laughs> what you're carrying is not going to impede you. It's going to ensure that you win the race. Then you got to run past it. Everybody say run past it. Run past it. Elijah had a track record with God. Watch this. I love God because Elijah is a forerunner. And God allows him to run past something that was meant to beat him. He was running past something that was meant to be the victor. But I love chapter 18 because chapter 18 makes it very clear. That God would not allow this chapter to close with evil beating good. And I came to remind someone that feels like all your living has been in vain. That feels like God has not been paying attention to what you've been doing. I want you to know God's not going to allow prophetically this chapter to close in your life without good overcoming evil. I came here to tell you that you're about to be victorious and beat it. You got to run past it. I know they're trying to block you. I know they're trying to stop you. But can I prophesy to you? Some of you don't realize how much you've grown. And when you've grown, you can't keep talking to little people with little minds, with little opinions. You got to ignore it and keep moving. Because the objective of them is to stop you. But you got to learn how to run past them. Because you may be an enemy for me one season, but you may be my friend the next season. And so Elijah run past him. Look at somebody saying, run past it. Run past it. You ran with it, but you got to run past it. You're faster than you think you are when God's hand is upon your life. He's going to give you a turbo speed. He's going to give you an explosion. If you would just trust that his hand is on your life, he's able to outrun the king's horses. Because of something's intangible. Hey, can, can I ask you, do you know what you're capable of doing when God's hand is upon you? Some of you are like, it's nothing special about me. It's just his hand on me. I know his hand is on me, but ain't nothing else special about me. What else is there? You can run past chariots when you have his hand. I ain't nothing special. I don't got a lot of money. He's just got his hand on me. His hand has always been on my life. You got like that's just something just to say lightly. His hand is what makes the difference. Elijah runs past something he's used to running from. Can I prophesy to you when you know that God's hand is on your life, you can run past what you normally would run from. God, check me. He checked me. He checked me. He said, I think you're starting to trust in chariots. And I think you're starting to trust in horses. Because it's it's even the chariots and the horses that are frustrating you. Because horses and chariots take maintenance. You're trying to preserve the horses and the chariots because that's what people praise you for. 
the horses in the chariots because that's what people can see. You must have the favor of God on your life because of horses in chariots. But the truth of the matter is we have stopped putting our trust in what's intangible. Think about when he called you. You had none of the things you have today. It was all intangible. And when he spoke to me, he said, the church is going to lose the chariots. They should be because they started to trust in what's tangible instead of what's intangible. So everything is tangible. So, so you come to church, even when offering times, you look at it like it's the lottery because it's tangible. Instead of trusting in a God that's intangible. That tells you that the seed that leaves your hand never leaves your life, but enters into your future and prepares for your arrival. Watch this. We have started trusting in the tangible. Some of us say, even ask God, why have you called me? Because I don't have tangible gifts like everybody else. And he says, because I put something intangible in you. See, some of you don't have all the money you want, don't have all the position you want, don't have all the healing you want. But if all you have is a word, I know it seems intangible, but that's all you need. The reason I feel like I can't fail. It's if I stay in the will of God. Because that's an intangible force. Isn't that what David said? He said, by this I know that you favor me. Intangible. That my enemies don't triumph against me. It's not because I'm a skilled warrior. It's because, I'm going to talk about this later, an intangible called favor. See, that's why some of you frustrated because you try to buy the suit they have on. You try to buy the car they have. You try to live in the neighborhood they live in. And you can't get the same results because you don't have the intangibles. You can wear Jordans and still not be Michael Jordan. You, you can wear LeBrons and still not be because it's the intangibles. Not the tangibles. And I'm afraid in an effort to be practical, which I miss the practicality, we have stopped putting faith in what's intangible. And we started to trust what was tangible. And because of it, we've lost races. Because you can't win a race when you trust in horses and chariots and you don't have one. It shows that Elijah trusted in a greater power that he started moving his feet even though he didn't have a vehicle. Even though he didn't have a whip, he trusted in the God of miracles that could accelerate him. And I want you to know that God is showing us that he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And I want you to know that if you got something intangible, sooner or later God's going to bring something tangible into your life. Now, I need you to take about the next 20 seconds, even if you can't see God because he's spirit, to bless our God. If you know an intangible God can bless you in a tangible way, I want you to open your mouth and give him glory. Come on, I need you to praise him with faith. Even though I can't see you working, you never stop. You never stop. I need you to give God some praise. Thank you for your hand on my life. Thank you, God, that you're the greatest power, so I'll never be defeated. I feel like praying like the old saints. Thank you for keeping me from danger, seen and unseen. Thank you for being the very present help in the time of trouble. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you that the most valuable things in my life are not tangible. They're intangible. I need somebody to thank God for the Spirit of the Lord that's upon you. I'm not trying to preach too many messages too soon. But it wasn't Samson's hair that gave him strength. 
The Bible says the spirit of the Lord came upon him. Something intangible. He was not muscular. That's why people thought that they could take him. Because if he was muscular, they would ascribe strength to his muscles. But his strength came from something intangible. Let me give you these points and we're going home. But I came here to tell somebody, you acting like you bankrupt. You acting like you don't have anything. Because you don't have anything tangible yet. Let me say this, you may never get anything tangible if you don't first acknowledge what's intangible. First the spiritual, then the natural. That's why people come to church, they don't understand your praise because you hear music over your head. That's intangible. And they're trying to grasp it with tangible means. But eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard. Neither has it entered to the heart of man what God has in store. I'm thanking God for what he's put on me that's intangible. Can I submit this to you? This is why I'm preaching my whole message. This is why the enemy has been fighting you because he sees something on you that's intangible. You think you broke. He sees you as anointed. You think you're sick. He sees you as anointed. You think you're confused. He sees you as anointed. What you can't see, he can see. The enemy is not fighting you for what's tangible. He's fighting you for what's intangible. He wasn't after Job's family. He wasn't after Job's money. He was after Job's commitment. He was after something intangible because God knows if you keep what's intangible, you can get back everything that's tangible. How far somebody said, I'm about to get it back. I'm about to get it back. I'm about to get it back. I lost a whole lot of things, but one thing I never lost, I never lost my praise. I'm about to get it back. No, y'all missed a prophetic moment. I said prophesy to somebody like you mean it and say, I'm about to get it back. I just remembered who I am. I just remembered who I am. No man takes my life. I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I pick it up again because I got something intangible. You forgot you were blessed. You forgot you were favored. You forgot you were anointed. I came here to remind you that the reason you're still here is because everything the devil tried didn't work. I I know some people are moving, but give me five more minutes. It's only the people in the spirit going to catch this. And this is why even if you don't have a relationship with God, you should get a relationship with God because watch this, money doesn't give you joy. But if you have joy long enough, you can make some money. Relationships don't give you peace. Matter of fact, they would disturb the peace. But if you have peace, you can maintain a relationship even though it's rocky. Intangible things produce tangible results. Trying to help us to get our priorities in order. Because we started trusting in horses and chariots. And stopped trusting in the name of the Lord. I had to remind myself of who I am. I'm not who I am because of the car I drive. I'm not who I am because of the place I live. Because a lot of that's just image. I'm who I am because of the intangible thing. Amen. We're going to wrap it up. Give me five more minutes. I want you to hear this. That God's hand is intangible. God's hand is intangible. Let me give you three points and we get out of here. That means God's hand is invisible. It's invisible. That means you won't always be able to see his hand. His hand is Invisible. His hand is incredible. 
Can anybody see God's hand in your life? And I want to remind you that God's hand is best seen in hindsight. Because hindsight is 20, 20. God's hand is so incredible that a man named Elijah who was out of shape, he runs for 30 miles ahead of a chariot because God's hand is incredible. Look over your life and see all the amazing things God has done. His hand is an incredible hand. And an incredible God deserves incredible praise. Give it to him. I said give it to him. You're incredible. When my enemies came to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. You're incredible. When my mother and father forsook me, that's when you took me up. You're incredible. When the weapon was formed that didn't prosper, you're incredible. When you transformed my life, you're incredible. You took my two fish and five loaves of bread. You're incredible. And let me give you the last point. We're gone. It's indispensable. I said it's indispensable. David says, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. He says, take not your Holy Spirit. Do y'all understand that David is talking as a king? That means he has a crown. He has a castle. He has family. He has notoriety. He's had victories. People have been singing his praises. Saul to kill his thousands. David is ten thousands. But he doesn't reach for those things first. Because he remembered when he was a shepherd and had nothing. And all he had what was, what was intangible things. And now that he had tangible things, he never lost sight of priorities. This is it's because of what you can't see that I have what you can see. He says, take not your Holy Spirit. Spirit is something you can't see. But he said, the Spirit makes the difference. Because of your Spirit, I was able to play the instrument until Saul was relieved. Because of your Spirit, Goliath came down. Because of your Spirit, even when I was in a cave, you sent some mighty men. Because of your Spirit, Absalom won't overtake me. Because of your spirit, even though I messed up with Bathsheba, I believe you're going to give me another chance. Because of your spirit. Because of your spirit, you've given me victory after 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 victory. After victory, 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 after victory. And the same God that gave me victory before will give me victory again. If you know if it had not been for the Lord on your side, you don't know where you would be. I need you to take the next 30 seconds and bless God like you're grateful. your spirit away from me take not your spirit away from me take not your spirit away from me your spirit makes the difference his spirit will revive your spirit I came to prophesy that God is reviving spirits on today God is reviving souls on today open your mouth and get what you need from the Lord I hear God saying, I'm still with you. I'm still with you. I'm still with you. I'm still with you. I know you lost some things. I know you had some setbacks, but I'm still with you. I'm still with you. 
I'm still with you. I know you shed some tears, but I'm still with you. I know you lost some friends, but I'm still with you. I know you've been disappointed, but I'm still with you. And because I'm with you, I'm going to bring you out without a doubt. And I can't even remind you that your chapter's going to close in victory. Watch your high five somebody say, this ends in victory. This ends in victory. No, I mean it. This ends in victory. Some trust in horses. Some trust in chariots. But we will put our trust in the name of the Lord. What will we put our trust in? I said, what will we put our trust in? Is his name enough? Is healing in his name? Is victory in his name? Is prosperity in his name? Is deliverance in his name? Do demons tremble in his name? I'm putting my trust in the name of the Lord. Tell me who can stand before us when we put our trust in that great name. What's his name? If God be for us, who can be against us? You've been losing your peace because you've been putting your trust in the wrong thing. You've been preserving the wrong thing. Your identity is connected to the wrong thing. And you forgot that when he called you, you had nothing. And if he ever left you, you would have nothing. Every runner, you won't win this race without a hand. You won't win the race. Even Jesus needed a hand. He said, if I be lifted up, I would draw all men. The Bible says that God raised him from the dead. Great runners need a hand. And I came here to acknowledge how much I need his hand. I've got degrees. I went to seminary, but that doesn't replace his hand. I study hard every week, but that does not replace his hand. I've got a good name, been given a good name, but that does not replace his hand. Got a great church who loves their pastor, but that doesn't replace his hand. You can make it if you know his hand is still on you. The reason they didn't starve with the multitude is because their fish and five loaves of bread made contact with his hand and his hand made all the difference. The king's hand does the king's bidding. And I came here to tell you some of you are disappointed because of what happened to your horses and chariots. But you can get it back if you have the name of the Lord. I came to prophesy to some of you. God was just trying to shift your priorities. Because you start trusting in what you could see instead of what you couldn't see. Let me remind you of this. Faith is intangible until it becomes tangible. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not See, how do you even have faith if you don't believe in intangibles? I'm here today because he kept me. Yeah. 
There's so many reasons why I should have failed. But his hand. Every time I show up to church, I'm amazed to see you. Because in my mind, you shouldn't still be here. But his hand. And God says, stop comparing yourself to other people who have tangible things. Because they can't see what I placed on the inside of you. Something intangible. 